Today's video is sponsored by Wanderlust Videos, the place to outsource your wedding film post-production. Welcome to the office today. I'm a little sunburnt. I got a little sunburnt yesterday. Maybe that's tip negative, negative one, bring sunscreen. Tip number two, if you are sunburnt, dial up the, the Kelvin in, in your camera or on your light and you kind of make yourself look less sunburnt overall. I know that because I just, I just did that and I don't know, it looks okay. Today, five pro tips for doing wedding films. Uh, I am, I guess to give scope of what I do. So I am usually not the dedicated cinematographer, videographer, video creator of a wedding day. I'm typically the lead photographer and also doing a highlight film. So my couples typically hire me and they only want a small highlight film. They want that two to four minute music video style. So they don't actually want audio. This is something that's come up in a few meetings that couples, they don't want to hear their voices a lot of the time. And I think that as video creators were like, oh, I'm gonna give them the bonus extra of recording all their speeches and I'm gonna put that in the video. And as it turns out, maybe this is a testament to getting yourself and your clients on the same page. A lot of my clients don't actually want that. So um, maybe something to think about. And I guess it's another, another tip before we even get to the tips. My first tip is maybe one that goes against what you might see a lot online when it comes to wedding video production. I like to be as light as I possibly can. Uh, I go to maybe an extreme on this. I would consider pretty much the most minimal kit possible. I don't use, so this I guess loops back to the fact that uh, I'm usually doing photography coverage as well as also doing a highlight film. I shoot everything handheld. I don't bring stabilizers. In-body stabilization and lens stabilization has come a very long way. This is what I bring. This is it, this is a Peak Design messenger bag. And in there, I can't spoil tip number three yet. Pro tip number two, shoot for your final edit. Uh, this might sound obvious. Uh, in the beginning, you're definitely gonna overshoot. You're gonna shoot way too many clips and you're gonna come home and it's gonna be too much to edit. Um, send your, your post-production to Waterlust videos if you, if you need help, the sponsor of today's video. I'm not gonna go into the ad yet, we'll do that then. But shooting for the final edit, Watch a lot of highlight films in the genre that you want to be creating them in and see what shots are used, what transition shots you're, go you're going to need between venues, what opening shots you're going to need, what kind of shots you're going to need for closings. There is no secret roadmap to creating a highlight film that everyone, when they've created one, it's, it's there, you can watch it. So you can, you can absorb all of that information by watching other people's work. And it will be a bit of a learning process that it might take you four or five weddings to really figure out like, okay, like I'm not going to use any of the family formal photos of why did I record video coverage of that? That's never going to make the film. So for the edit and kind of know where you're at in the edit as well have a timeline running in your brain to know kind of whereabouts you are if you need a transition shot or whatever you might need on to tip number three the gear that i bring very minimal i'm on the 7200 a lot that might seem a bit weird i guess to me maybe specifically say if i am there hired to do video for the day the 7200, I could do an entire film on this lens, no problem. Uh, this allows me to kind of zoom around rather than physically walking around or being in the way of the photographer doing photos. Um, I can zoom and get the shots that I need. I don't know where my 85 Samyang is, but I like that lens a lot as a main lens and I could all, probably also get through an entire day. I have a lot of times um, just shooting an 85 millimeter 1.4 only and I'll shoot it wide open at 1.4 unless given a reason not to. Uh, and then another lens that is nice to have is some sort of kind of normal zoom. This is the Canon RF 24 to 70. Um, again, could probably shoot an entire wedding day with this. I would probably prefer if I have the ability and I have space to shoot on something like this. Next tip. Audio. I know this goes against what I talked about earlier, but I think that audio is something that is very important to learn. Um, it really will make your wedding films go to the next level if you are with the couples that actually want their audio in the wedding films. Uh, we use two things. We usually bring two of these Tascam packs or Tascam DR10Ls. They're not wireless transmitters. They're just simply standalone recorders. You put this typically either on an officiant or somebody wearing a suit at the front of the maybe groom um, so that you're able to capture vows in case the mic uh, doesn't work or if they just don't even use a mic at all. Um, backups of backups of backups. So have two of these kind of running for the most important moments as well as a room mic as well. And then this is the H5. Uh, you can get an H4N, you can get an H6, whatever whatever you want. They all kind of do the same thing. Um, just depends on what your needs are maybe outside of weddings. Um, for a wedding day, an H5 or an H4N is totally acceptable. Uh, what I usually use it for is the XLR input down here or you can do the quarter inch, just plugs in the middle. Um, or you can go up here to the auxiliary and you can also be running these room mics at the same time. So you can put this kind of by the DJ, by the speaker and you can be running in to on channel one for the, the XLR input. So when somebody's on the microphone, this microphone is not working right now. So somebody's on the microphone like this, I probably should use this. Well, I don't, this is the, 
NTG video mic, it's, it's nice. So when someone is on the microphone, you're getting that exact feed in here. Again, have backups because things go wrong. Sometimes things are too loud. This will flicker if you're clipping, if the, the audio is too loud. Just definitely get one of these and then bring your own cords. Don't rely on the DJ to have cords for you. Um, an XLR cord, they're around somewhere. RCA connector, it's, it's old, but a lot of the, even the, the USB decks still have them, uh, as well as kind of a, a patch cord for a guitar cable as well. Um, and usually you'll be covered if, uh, if not, usually the DJ can help you out, but if you can show up and be ready to go, they're gonna appreciate you a lot more and they're gonna do some, maybe some bonus things to help you out. Like if they see that your audio is too loud to like flag you to, to come over, which has happened before. And now the last and final tip, looking back, I should have ordered these differently so that I could have ended on something that was more explosive and amazing. Uh, the last tip is that venue lighting sucks, that it is pretty much the worst, that they, I would say there's maybe two venues that I've ever been in that have had some sort of light design that is actually flattering to people speaking on microphones or up at the front of say a church or in the ceremony space. So make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into. If you know it's gonna be a beautiful, like naturally daylit ceremony and you're under a, a tent or something, you might not need to bring a light for this ceremony, but when it comes time for speeches and you're kind of in that weird in-between time where it's kind of ambient still, it's kind of blue hour and everything's blue and weird out there and then the tent's really warm, you're gonna want something to be able to kind of offset the weirdness of that. This all said, uh, I will say that most of the time I don't actually set up any lighting uh, that when I'm doing, I guess this is more from the scope of myself as a photo slash video creator, that there's usually one direction that people can look that's not going to be the worst lighting ever. I'm just basically, if there's a huge pot light above them and they look this way and the pot light's kind of on the side of their face and I can be over in this direction getting that shot, all of a sudden I've kind of, I, I need that one to two second clip and that's all I need. Um, so if I do have that lighting pocket, I'll work with that, which you usually can find. I do this a lot for photography as well, that if I'm not setting up an off camera flash, something that I can just usually find those small moments in good light and I can get the shots that I need without adding anything to the scene to make it, I don't know, I find that setting up lighting is a little bit obtrusive. It's necessary, I think, if you're doing a full length wedding video, but if you're just doing a highlight film, you can usually get by without it. Um, just make sure that you're getting what you actually want in your camera uh, because you're going to be pretty limited in post-production, how you can move the colors around and how you can move the exposure if it is bad lighting. And that is all for my five tips for wedding videos. I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Wanderlust Videos, the place that you can outsource your wedding video post-production. So say you're watching this and you're like, wow, this all sounds good. I'm gonna be the best video person ever, but I don't really want the added workflow of now sitting down and going through all this footage, especially if you're shooting with multiple cameras and multiple shooters. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody could just, just do all that for you? And uh, do I have the solution for you? Um, so honestly, Wanderlust Videos, uh, they reached out to me, I guess a couple of months ago now, and they're like, hey, give us a test, like send in some footage. I shot a wedding and I sent them all the footage. And the video that came back that you're seeing on the screen now, is better, like absolutely, I, I say this a lot about uh, that usually when you're sending your stuff out for post-production from somebody else, they're gonna do a better job than you would. And in wedding video, this is 100% the case that the, the video edit they put together was better than I ever could have done. Uh, it was cut better, it was colored so much better. I'm not a colorist by nature uh, and they did an incredible job as well as adding warp stabilizer at the right time. They did all kinds of amazing things and they just, it was a very quick, send them all the footage, and then you just get the, the final version back and you're just done. Um, so dream come true for sure. And I am super happy to one, know about their existence because I didn't know that anyone did this in the wedding video space. And I was honestly so happy with the edit that they sent back to me. So go check them out if you're interested in outsourcing your wedding video post-production, which I do recommend figuring out how to do that pretty early on because the, the increased workflow, um, again, from the scope of myself as a photographer slash video creator, to do both on the same day, adds so many hours of post-production and to have both of those pieces outsourced um, makes your life easier. You can spend that time booking more work or traveling or hanging out with your family, going to the cottage, whatever it might be. You're kind of buying, you're, bu you're buying your, a little bit of your time back. That's all for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Taylor Jackson. I'll see you again next time. Don't forget to subscribe, like this video if you like this video, or that's all. I've, again, never know how to end these.